Okay, our last talk of the week is Tony Bang. He'll talk about Chris Rubinius, past, present, and future. Okay, thanks for the invitation to speak. I know it's been a long week, so I'm going to be talking about something which I think is relatively naive. I'm also a number theorist, and uh, one of the things I like to do is think about solving equations over somewhat exotic number of systems. So I'd like to warm up in particular by thinking about counting how many solutions this equation has over the field of p elements. And if you're doing this by brute force, well, you just plug in some value for x, and you look at the right-hand side and ask yourself, is it a square? About half the numbers in fp are squares, and when they're squares, they have two square roots, more or less. So you can actually model this counting process by a random process, where you plug in a random number for x, and you find that it has, on average, one square root. And the deviation from that expected value is, uh, is a random point form. It's plus one with probability one half and minus one with probability one half. So this leads you to suspect that there should be, since there's p possible values for x, about p solutions with an, uh, an error on the order of magnitude of the square root of p. Now that's, that's a kind of asymptotic analysis. And to imitate this limiting step, we're going to ask about how many solutions there are over the finite extension to that p. And the same analysis applies to suggest that there should be about p to the n solutions with a deviation of about uh, p to the n over 2. And this is in fact true, and it's a, a case, a special case of something called Bayes conjecture. So I'm going to return to this shortly, but first I'd like to point out uh, one of the characteristic features of working over a field like fp. Namely, n characteristic p, meaning a setting where p is 0, the p power map becomes additive. So this is something we've already seen earlier this week. And this implies that anytime you have a solution to polynomial equations over at p, then the p power is also a solution. Because to say that a comma b is a solution is to say that some polynomial in a and b is zero, and therefore its p power is also zero, and then you can distribute this p power over the addition and multiplication. So to summarize, um, over fp, there is a symmetry of the space of solutions to polynomial equations, which sends a comma b to a to the p comma b to the p. And this symmetry is called the Frobenius endorphism. All right, so now I'd like to return to this story that we started out with. Here I analyzed some particular equation, but actually there's a much more general story. So there's a statement uh, for more complicated systems of equations uh, called Bayes conjecture. And it was proved by Deleuze some number of years ago. And I'm not going to say much about the proof, but I want to highlight that uh, early on, the key step is that one reinterprets this count of the number of solutions to your equations as the trace of some power of Frobenius endomorphism on a vector space associated with Z. And this identity, due to growth and is what allows one to bring extra structure into this question. So it enables geometric and algebraic tools, such as the ones that I've listed here. And I'd like to focus on this identity a bit more. I find it very interesting that uh, a seemingly innocent question about counting numbers of solutions to equations turns out to be really a question about an endomorphism of the vector space, which I think is a much more sophisticated concept. Um, so there are many applications in this style in the literature. And I'd like to ask what might be next in the story. And as this picture suggests, what I mean by next is in a kind of metamathematical sense. That is to say, if there are questions about numbers, which are really reflections of problems about vector spaces, then it stands to reason that there could be problems about vector spaces, which are really reflections of problems about something even more sophisticated. And I'm not committed to vector spaces here. I would regard rings or complexes of vector spaces and so on to be objects at a similar level of abstraction. So to help us guess what might be coming next, I've drawn, I've gone into the world numbers and vector spaces and drawn little snapshots of what I saw. And what you can see is that the difference is one of these things has arrows. So numbers, um, well, there's a notion of equality between numbers, but other than that, not much relation. Whereas vector spaces, Vector spaces have rich maps between each other. And so 
some of you may see that what should come next in this hierarchy is the notion of a category. Categories have objects, they have maps between objects, and unlike vector spaces, which only really have a notion of equality between maps, categories have maps between their maps. So in fact, um, Bensby and Adler and Gates story have explained that how that is very natural to take the trace of an endomorphism of a category. Um, and it behaves as we anticipated. For some types of categories, the answer will be a vector space. For other types of categories, the answer will be a ring. <clears throat> and it's not too hard to write down the construction, actually. One can do it in a couple of short lines with the caveat that it depends on a couple of not so short orange books written by Murray developing sort of the theory of higher categories. OK, so I'm a concretely minded person, and I'm looking at this and wondering, well, what does this mean for stuff that I can wrap my head around? I'm going to be telling you about a couple of applications, which I think are illustrative of what we can do at present. So uh, one type of application is exemplified by this, a new categorical proof of the Harrisburg Riemann Rock theorem. I wouldn't say that it's an uh, easier proof. In fact, maybe I would say it's the hardest proof. But it has a certain virtue that it makes this formula seem like it comes from some really um, simple categorical principle. And the, the compl complications that arise, such as type classes and so on, uh, are found in the kind of algorithmic process of taking the trace. OK, another type of application is the work of Xiao and Zhu on the key conjecture for products of special hybrid and Shimura varieties. There's some 200 pages of papers here, and if you read them, you will not learn what a categorical trace is. But uh, really, what's going on is they write down some very complicated construction, which can be seen as secretly coming from a much simpler construction at the level of categories. And again, the point is that the complication arises in this kind of algorithmic step of taking the trace. So, what we've seen is that you can use this categorical notion of a trace to, to predict what should be true, to heuristically derive instructions, to conceptualize certain kinds of complicated calculations. But what I personally don't know how to do at present with it is to prove statements about really concrete objects that can't be proved as also by concrete methods. That's not to say that category theory at large isn't useful for such things. It's extremely useful, of course, for proving things about numbers and vector spaces. But I'm just focused on the more narrow question of, uh, I guess there's some property of categories such that when we take the trace, we see some totally new property about vector spaces. I don't know of any such examples right now, but I'm going to be telling you about something that might be an example in the near future. Okay, so I'm going to, I was asked to present an open problem in this talk, and I'm going to do that now. We call that a Lie algebra. G is some vector space, which you can think of as a vector space of matrices, uh, which has a notion of commutator, or in other words, Lie bracket. So for example, such things are classified over the complex numbers. Uh, one type of Lie algebra is the Lie algebra of n by n matrices, whose commutator is the usual commutator of matrices. That's something called type A. There's also a type B, which are uh, odd dimensional skew symmetric matrices, again, whose commutator is the usual commutator. And the commuting variety conjecture predicts that uh, if you take the commuting variety of pairs of elements in your Lie algebra, which, uh, whose commutator is zero, or in other words, which commute, then this thing should be reduced. And what that means is if you take the equations which define it, then uh, anytime you find an equation of the form f squared equals zero, you can also find the equation f equals zero. So maybe this would be a little more concrete in an example. If I'm talking about GL2, then we'd be looking at a system of eight variables that's two, two by two matrices, and we impose the equa equations required to make these matrices compute. And what it would mean to say that this is reduced is that if you took the ring of functions on this space, polynomial ring in eight variables, modulo these equations, and if you found a polynomial p whose square is zero, then p itself is already zero in this ring. So what's something not reduced? Well, if this somehow boiled down to 
like C you join A mod A squared, then A would not be zero, but the square is zero. That's not reduced. Okay, now notice that this system of equations has a large symmetry group because if I simultaneously conjugate two commuting matrices, they'll still commute with each other. Okay, so in this case, deal two x on the space of solutions by simultaneous conjugation. In general, for any real algebra, there will be some group acting on the commuting variety by simultaneous conjugation. And a weakening of the previous conjecture is that this variety, commuting variety, up to conjugation action is reduced. So the ring of functions here is, by definition, an invariant subring of the ring of functions on the full commuting variety. And this conjecture is certainly implied by the other one, but it's still open and narrow. OK, so notice that this was all questions about the complex numbers. I haven't mentioned characteristic p anywhere here. So what does this have to do with the trace of forbearance? I'm going to tell you about uh, some joint speculation in progress with Dennis Gates Square. And what we find is that something quite close to this commuting variety of the conjugation arises as the trace of Frobenius uh, on a category. Now, here I'm referring, it's really the ring of functions which arises as the trace of Frobenius. And moreover, that category has a name because it's a, a very important category in the geometric language program. And its name is the coherence copy category for G. And the remarkable thing about this category is that it is equivalent to another category which looks a priori like it has a totally different origin. Um, in particular, this second category is a category of sheaves on an object in characteristic P, and that's where the forbearance really comes from. Um, so here I'm invoking a version of this equivalence, which is the recently announced theorem of where you can copper problem. This presents the possibility of computing the trace in a completely different way on this right-hand side. And it turns out that if you do this, you'll find something which also already has a name. And it's called the dirac heck algebra for this Langlands dual group. And it is, well, there's several things with that name. So I'll clarify that it's uh, a version which was introduced and studied by Langlands. And I should qualify that these derivations of the trace are a bit heuristic right now. The heuristic could think something precise, and I do expect it to be true on the nose, but uh, certainly there's a number of technicalities which would need to be addressed to make it uh, truly rigorous computation. Anyway, our perspective was that uh, the category theory predicts what should be true. There should be some isomorphism of algebras on this bottom line, and then we should just try and prove that by kind of traditional methods. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's just something obvious. But actually, it wasn't obvious to us. And we have some evidence that is hard. For example, uh, if our picture is correct, then it implies that, well, this conjecture that I stated, that the commuting variety up to conjugation is reduced at least in types A, B, and C. And that itself comes as a consequence of some rather more precise theory. And the point here is that whatever isomorphism of algebras is being produced is sufficiently non trivial that a problem which is really hard on one side becomes trackable on the other side. And information goes the other way as well. So something really fundamental that we don't know about this drive tech algebra is that it's commutative. And this picture almost immediately implies that, in fact, it, it is commutative, at, at least away from small characteristics where it probably category three breaks down. Okay, and that's all I've got. So thanks for your attention. Questions? You tell in which situation for which category an endomorphism a notion of trace is defined and uh, what kind of object it is? Yeah, so I have in mind a somewhat specific situation where I consider um, dualizable categories. So uh, I, when I think the trace of my categories will be so, so called co complete. I'll ask them to be dualizable, and I'll ask for this endomorphism. Do you want to know in other category? Uh, it's, it's an object within an ambient monoidal category. Um, in this case, it will be category in, an ambient category uh, of categories, which has some notion of a tensor product introduced by Larry. And I want to be dualizable, and I want the endomorphism to be some continuous endomorphism.
And where does this reducedness come from on the other side? Um, so actually, for this thing up to conjugation, it, there's a much better way to state the conjecture, which is that um, that the thing for G mod conjugation is is isomorphic to the thing for uh, our concept of mod uh, invariance under the Bible mod Bible group. And for the Cartan subgroup, well, it's commuted to begin with, so it's kind of obvious that the commuted variety is, is reduced. And so that's, that's the kind of more precise thing I'm alluding to. Yep. Has the conjecture been checked by computer up to like more of a number and stuff? Um, so this statement, I think, has been checked in type A. And uh, yeah, in other types, I, I'm not sure to what extent it has been checked. Uh, in examples. So the for the groups. Yep. Is it possible to say two more words about the Sarink and Bezra Kavnikov equivalents? What what's in so that is that the Sataki category of coherent shoes on the left? Yeah, so but in particular it's the um you want to take the derived category. Right category. So on the right, maybe I'll start with the right. Uh, you would take the equivariant derived category of you know, G of O equivariant shoes on the Grassmannian. And on the right, it's, uh, well, it's the thing which corresponds to it. So it's some version of the Lee algebra mod uh, the group, except uh, the, I guess the twist is that we need to take mod of the coefficients to make something interesting. other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers for the week.